And um, yeah, that will allow us to share, share this discussion with colleagues um, who aren't able to make it today. Um, so my name is Jim Robinson. I'm the coordinator of the Global Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility within the Global Protection Cluster. And I'm really pleased to be co-facilitating this webinar with Davide. Davide, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Jim. Hello to everyone. Good morning from Rome and good uh, evening or afternoon to all of you. So my name is Davide Rossi. I'm very pleased as well to co-facilitate this webinar with you, Jim, and thanks to the Food Security and Agriculture team in Afghanistan and the Protection Cluster and the HLP Task Force for inviting us and giving us this opportunity. I work with the Global Food Security Cluster. I have been deployed previously as a cluster coordinator in various countries, and now I am a focal point for uh, for the region of Asian Pacific, for the agriculture working group, but that we have a global level and for the partnership initiatives. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Davide. And um, just by means of a, we're going to offer a brief introduction from our, our perspective as um, from the to sort of a global level of the food security agriculture cluster and the HLP cluster and then we'll move quickly into hearing from colleagues um, working on on these issues in Afghanistan and from a, a more regional global perspective as well later on so just as a brief bit of background um, this for, this webinar is co-hosted by the housing land and property task force which um, uh, is is a, a really active and engaged um, group of HLP practitioners and uh, working in Afghanistan and, and doing some very inspiring work. Um, at the global level, the HLP area of responsibility, we we work to uh, to support um, colleagues like those in Afghanistan, support the housing, land, and property coordination and response, and we also want to enhance the awareness of inclusion of housing, land, and property issues and considerations at all phases. So, um, whilst the AOR is part of the protection cluster. We work closely across many clusters and sectors, and it's something we're really keen to develop. And um, we work with the, with shelter colleagues, CCCM, livelihoods, food security and agriculture, WASH, and then of course durable solutions and Nexus. Wherever there are challenges with recognition of rights and around housing, land, and property, that's who we're trying to sort of develop and uh, relationships with and, and work with those colleagues. Um, looking at um, this. This topic in Afghanistan. I mean, as we know, secure land rights can be the foundation of social and economic equity. Um, in many countries, interventions on land rights require a real joined up approach between those legal approaches and livelihood partners as well to ensure durable solutions that will enact meaningful change. Global best practices show that when legal recognition of land and housing rights are combined with complementary investments in land, housing, and infrastructure, they can lead to more secure rights for vulnerable groups over the long term. Due in part to COVID-19 and seasonal labour changes, disruptions to livelihood profiles for people living in urban and peri-urban spaces are a reoccurring case of vulnerability. And that's something that's been seen in Afghanistan quite a lot. This has effects on health, food security and intergenerational poverty. People who are dependent on market purchases and fragile livelihoods can be forced into ever deeper cycles of debt to meet their food expenditure needs. And having access to alternate food sources is an important way to provide subsistence level solutions to meet basic caloric horrific intake and to mitigate additional exposure to negative coping mechanisms. This webinar today, we looked uh, uh, at that intersection between housing, land and property and agriculture and livelihoods opportunities. If you have one without the other, you don't get as complete and as uh, full uh, a solution as you need. More specifically, we will highlight the ways that investing in urban agriculture can provide an opportunity to integrate HLP with food security and the agriculture sector priorities that will create a more diverse sources of food for household consumption. And this is all about building in that, that resilience, allowing people to, to get what they need to, uh, to, to, to survive and to build their lives going forward. There are some risks in, in this whole area, in this, in this um, thinking about urban agriculture and land rights. And I want to leave you just with these, these thoughts on these topics. Um, Often subsistence urban agriculture can remain informal and has trouble connecting with like essential utilities such as water. And that can lead to informal tapping, which can waste water in a water scarce country. And it can also have legal protection risks as well. So that's something we need to really think about. 
there may be further links that can be made uh, beyond land to include, include property in this context of uh, urban agriculture. For example, maybe there's something to think about in terms of assets to improve storage of food and, and other, other consumables to avoid spoilage. Um, it could be around subsistence only or it could be something more ambitious. There could be uh, the development of assets for processing and storage to add value to the, uh, to the food that's produced. There could be something around access to high quality market stalls and retail locations that will also have a land rights dimension. And for each of these, there are questions of control and ownership of assets. Given the relatively high capital costs sometimes, maybe collective control and management, it could be a, a, an interesting thing to explore. Um, and here I think there are linkages to concepts of owning and controlling businesses, either formally or informal, that are going to all kind of depend upon that, uh, that different uh, thoughts of around land rights and about how we consider what property means in this context. So now I'd like to pass over to David a to give some uh, initial thoughts and, uh, and then in introduce, yeah, and then I'll come back and introduce the, the next part of the, the webinar. Thank you, Jim. Um... I think you, you had already introduced quite a lot. You told me before that you didn't know too much about food security, but it's not true. <laughs> so thanks for that. Now, I believe that uh, what is important, uh, it's, uh, we, we welcome very much from the global perspective, also from the global food security cluster, this initiative. And we understand that also we, we have, uh, and we can do much more also with our global, uh, with our colleagues at global uh, level. So I think it's a good opportunity also for us to, to trigger our, um, teams and to, to to have new ideas on that. I think that uh, the, the the HLP rights are key to food security generally, and in this case we see how how much uh, are are important in urban agriculture, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. I think that the most important reflection is that to understand that when, uh, for example, urban agricultural opportunities uh, comes uncontrolled may uh, put uh, a lot of risk, which are social risk, uh, risk related to the environment and to the health of the people. When the uh, opposite, those are uh, well coordinated and, and, uh, and taken into consideration, uh, that can be an improvement, not only from the food security side of the people, but also from the social cohesion and the, what we call the peace def development, especially in, in countries and especially towards this uh, group that are actually um, the one that are more uh, uh, most vulnerable. We always have to uh, tell ourselves, are we reaching the most vulnerable? Are we reaching the one that are in remote areas? And sometimes the remote areas is not just a geographical kind of uh, uh, thing. It's, it's really also urban. The, other uh, population on certain urban center make ourselves more, much more, uh, make our life much more difficult in, ter in terms of reaching the most vulnerable with food security. And we know it uh, also, this issue was raised very much during the COVID time. So I believe that uh, urban agriculture in particular, there are a lot of, uh, you know, technical people that can uh, tell you much better than I, uh, how much is important in food security, but a couple of reflections is that urban agriculture increase for sure food security along the three main pillars, which is access, availability, and uh, sustainability. Then there are, let's say, some, uh, let's say, five kind of uh, issues where urban agriculture is proved to be uh, very much uh, key on food security which is, again, access, economic access to, to food. It is to boost the fresh food supply uh, when, uh, when we are talking about urbanization, lower cost in terms of startup, and uh, uh, shortened production cycle. There are many techniques that uh, are proved that urban agriculture can really have a, a very, very high and important production cycle. And then creates employment. Creates employment and create uh, a lot of uh, cascade effect on the food systems within urban centers. Last but not least, I would, uh, I would say that uh, also uh, one of the um, most important thing that uh, uh, for the reflection of today is also the woman role, which is very important in agriculture. We know that there are many studies and I, I'm curious also to know more because I know that HLP rights are, are very often denied to 
to women. And uh, so this is also, you know, some background thoughts that I would leave to, to the audience. Um, thanks again, and uh, over to you, Jim, for your reflection. Thank you, Davide. Thank you um, for some yeah, really interesting points to highlight then. And um, I think we will hear uh, a number of those uh, perspectives engaged with from colleagues. We're going to have um, some fantastic speakers uh, today looking at both the context in Afghanistan and some of the innovative responses to challenges there, as well as them finishing with a more global perspective before we're going to open up for questions and um, and, and discussion. Um, so I just wanted to say a few a few words um, on, on that. Um, just some some housekeeping, a short practical comment. Um, so just that unless you are speaking, please could you kindly keep your microphone on on mute and your video off just to uh, prevent disturbances, but also to reduce any strain on the bandwidth and our streaming capacity. But please, as you are doing, please use the uh, the chat function for comments and for questions and to introduce yourself to the group if you would like. When it comes to the discussion, um, you can raise your hand um, and, and we can invite you to ask a question or use the chat function again and we will gather together myself, Davide and some colleagues can gather together uh, questions and if your question is for one of the presenters specifically, please do put their name at the beginning of the question so we know who it's for. Otherwise, we will open it up to the panellists and, and then host the discussion um, in that way. But yeah, thank you again for being here. We have about one hour, 15, 16, 17 minutes left. So a good time to hear from the panelists and then to have some discussion. Uh, Davide, I'll pass back to you to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thanks again to all. Um, I, I think we are, uh, we are taking the question at the very end of the all presentations. So feel free, however, to, to write the question in the chat as Jim was highlighting. And, uh, and maybe you can write the name at the, before the, the question, the name of the person you want to, you want to approach or to ask a question to. And, um, or, or if it is a general comment, uh, uh, feel free to, to put it in, into there. So we will have six speakers. We will be having this uh, bad role of timekeeping as well. You, we, we were thinking you will have in between seven and 10 minutes. So up to you. But we will remind you if you are uh, going to be too uh, far. So we'll have six uh, key speakers, which uh, are uh, from uh, six different organizations, World Vision, Action Against Hunger, CRS, MEDER, UN Habitat, and the NRC. So I would call uh, the first one, who is Faraidun Barekzai, who is the Senior Zonal Manager for the World Vision. So over to you, Faraidun. Hi, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me share on my screen. The, um, Uh, can you see my screen? What somebody confirmed that? Good. Yes. 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 We can. Yeah. See the screen. Hi, my name is Faisal Barakze. I'm the senior zone manager for World Vision, uh, and I have a, a livelihood. I kind of like a um, working in the livelihood. My my area of uh, of uh, professionality is livelihoods. Okay, I'm going to because uh, we have a uh, for for the sake of the limited uh, time, I'm going. I will be a little. I, I need to be a bit faster in order to uh, to be able to 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 present all what uh, all the content of the my presentations. Thank you. Uh, just uh, before I'm starting with the with the presentation, I, I would like to give you uh, some uh, background on on background in terms of the soil. Uh, background for, for, for finding a solution for access uh, scarce of the soil and uh, water conservations. 
But uh, first, water and soil are, uh, for in Afghanistan, water and soil are most important resources in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan providing a livelihood base to the majority of the Afghan peoples. 80% 80 80 of the Afghans' residents' livelihood depend on some, some form of agricultural activities and its uh, domestic product. Traditional natural resource management, cooping and mitigation strategy have broken down under uh, growing population pressure, as well as the uh, collapse of the rural, uh, rural uh, economy. And also, uh, despite all these things, dispute over the management of natural resources, such as land, water, timber, mineral, and uh, underlying and driven many of the local conflict. The, the many local conflict, the, the, the main drive of the local conflict is or, or over the managing the resources and also under utilizing of the water resources. Also the, the, the total irrigated area of our Afghanistan is 3.2 million, but out of this only we are able to, to, to irrigate 1.2 1, 1 million hectares of, uh, of land for agriculture. The, 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 the remaining 1.8 million hectares stay unutilized due to lack of infrastructures. Infrastructures are also uh, using the traditional way of traditional practices of irrigation. Also, the, the amount of available water should be enough to cover current and future use, but but is under uh, uh, under utilization uh, out of a total of 35 billion cubic meters of available water. Only limited amounts are being used. Just that uh, we, uh, as a world, based on our experience, we identified some of the challenges towards sustainable use of soil and water reservoir. The main uh, reason for resource degradation in urban and uh, pre-urban sitting or this is based on our experience working in Afghanistan. An unaccelerated, un unsustainable oversee of natural resources, especially in urban and pre urban areas, rapid urban development and expansion of housing settlements, increased soil and water erosion, decline of groundwater table, overgrazing, deforestation, increasing plant uh, nutrient deficiency and loose in soil fertility, lack of knowledge on soil and conservation techniques, improper crop rotation, flood drought and economic pressures, increasing urban population resulting in the com competing to access and utilizing these resources, community infrastructure related to agriculture production, such as irrigation system and water uh, impoundments, bridge and road are badly damaged. The lack of prioritizing access to and um, benefit from natural resources, and also the limited access to water for irrigation, and also the lack of prioritizing access and benefit from the natural resources. Uh, also, land mine is another issue. Also, unclear tenure uh, uh, lease, leasehold right is another issue. Gender discrimination and lack of access, accurate uh, land use, land distribution, and resource data. Weak legal mechanism and coordination at a different level for resource management. But overall, uh, overall, uh, our conclusion is that the challenge for everyone involved in the development of Afghanistan is very clear. Improve the land and water resources, which can provide immediate income, food, security, uh, from, uh, foundation for new livestock practices, and much more. Water and soil are central to all of this. But what we should what should be should be done based on world vision experience uh, and also application of all these uh, these uh, activities we found out these these are this the proposed uh, intervention which we are going to uh, to propose that we rule rule it out all those things and then we found it very beneficial in order to tackle some of those challenges the first things uh, in uh, in the world visions uh, based on the uh, experience from the field is is work with the government in formulating the national land policy in, in there is a we are experiencing lack of uh, national there's no national policy or uh, well, land, uh, land policy and building are related in institution structure for land and administration, especially uh, delineating the boundary of pasture and re-establishing uh, agreement on use. 
improve produ uh, procedures for identifying leg legitimate claims to urban uh, properties and documenting legitimate claims to rural lands, and also improving system efficiency by reducing water loose at all level, level of the irrigation systems, improve irrigation scheduling of different crops, uh, and restrict irrigation at the critical growth stage of the crop to mitigate the effect of dry spill and ensure reasonable good yield, particularly with the urban agriculture. Because we, we have a very limited land with limited resources, and also the, the, our farmers, they, they don't know how, uh, the scheduling of water uh, scheduling of water cropping the uh, water water for each crops, improve the management of upper catchment by reducing the deforestation and better ring land and water watershed management. Initiate recharge program to manage depleting groundwater aquifer through delay uh, delay action dam rainwater harvesting and other arti arti artificial recharge programs. And also prioritizing women empowerment in the, in the agriculture sector, and also promoting of uh, and also finding alternative income generation activities to reduce poverty and discourage seasonal migration. And finally, we we uh, we are recommending to establish community lead benefit driving natural resource management is key to solving environmental, economic, and social issues related to the sustainable use of water and soil resources, and also uh, stabilization of the urban agriculture sector, especially horticulture. We are encouraging, uh, for, particularly for the urban agriculture, for the peoples to, to start uh, kind of like a, a grow, uh, Use more on uh, on horticulture. In horticulture is is as horticulture is agriculture is economy fuel social economic uh, cycle economic development helps eliminate poverty and also reduce violence and also the sector therefore has been a principal part of the peace process especially in light of the fact. Almost 80% of Afghan perceive poverty and uh, unemployment are the major cases of uh, conflict. And also we say that uh, improving the urban agriculture sector for the job creation, sustainable development, food and uh, natural uh, uh, nutrition security and women economic empowerment is then vital for the long-term security of the nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faridun. Very clear and uh, not too much. Uh, some, sometimes you are cutting a bit, but I think people could follow also thanks to your slides. Um, and very good timing. Um, so um, as we said already, uh, let's uh, write question on the, on the chat uh, while we pass through the next uh, speaker. So I would leave the floor now to Thomas Nobre. Uh, who is the Deputy Director of uh, Action Against Hunger. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Ahmed Davide. Hello, everyone. So I will share my screen. Could you please just like confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can, and we can okay. hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I think like I will, I will present like a one pilot uh, project that we did for like multi-sector intervention based on provision of drinking water, promotion of hygiene, and vertical gardening. So the focus, uh, like for in the presentation, will be on the vertical gardening um, that happened like in Kabul informal settlements. So it was like a few years ago. It happened like um, end of 2016, beginning of 2017. Um, so for that, yeah, we'll have a quick uh, overview of the project, um, describe a bit like the activities uh, implemented, uh, focusing mainly on the vertical gardening, and finally to share also with everyone the lessons learned, so best practices as well as uh, the challenges. Uh, in, in terms of 
project. Uh, so the context uh, of the implementation was uh, in Kabul. So we selected like two camps in Kabul uh, informal settlements, uh, which is um, contain like a, an host uh, many people. So I think in 2016, there were like a number of um, people um, in the Kabul informal settlement were like over uh, uh, 45,000. Um, and for that, so we decided like to implement wash intervention and also like a, a part of uh, vertical gardening as a pilot. So it was integrated approach, a pilot also to draw like yeah, the, uh, this uh, kind of lessons learned for the potential like future programming. Um, in terms of activities, uh, we are like um, on the wash side, uh, so distribution of uh, BSF, um, training as well for hygiene and sanitation, um, hygiene promotion, uh, some distribution of hygiene kits as well. And for what would be like more interesting like for us today, uh, we are like um, training and establishment of uh, vertical gardens. So I've put also like the main activities and the work plan because so as mentioned, it was uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017. So quite short project, in fact, and we will see that th there will be also like some impact on the lessons learned uh, because of that. And I think the duration of the project is part of the potential like improvement uh, to, to increase the impact. Um, also like with the crop season, uh, the real like implementation after the uh, all the coordination starting really like in, in December. So it was um, mainly like on six, seven months implementation. Um, here you can see how like, it was to share also like some uh, photos to give us an idea uh, more concrete. You, you can see like different uh, type of structure uh, because the plan also was to uh, identify which one could be like the most relevant. Uh, to try to identify and the, the, the production to uh, um, be able like to, to decide for like potential like new project, uh, who, which one would be like the, the most uh, appropriate. If we start uh, now like regarding like the, the project uh, with the lessons learned uh, in terms of like uh, best practices and success that we, we saw during the implementation. Uh, we had like three main uh, success. Uh, maybe like the most important one was uh, the fact that beneficiaries uh, had access to vegetables uh, when the price, prices of the, um, in the market were quite high. So I think the implementation as we saw in the work plan starting in December with uh, distribution of seeds, and uh, then after like all the training also for like cultivation, irrigation, uh, also of the of the gardens happen to have like um, after like there's the results uh, around like uh, July, mainly and the, the following months. Um, what allowed us like to, to have like this success was yeah the distribution of different types uh, of vegetable seeds also to have uh, not only like one uh, vegetable. Uh, to really like improve the, the nutrition also situation of, of the household. Um, the second like success uh, was yeah to, to increase like the, the knowledge to really like uh, have a focus uh, on trainings to have like good results and appropriate like production according like to the work uh, put like in, in the in the gardens. Uh, for that uh, it was a lot like it was necessary to have like practical training, sensitization. And one part important was the monitoring visit to be sure also that the practice uh, and the training were well understood after uh, by uh, all the participants. Uh, one recommendation would be like also to, to provide a bit more um, like leaflets to allow like maybe like communication also after to have kind of uh, training of trainers to allow like people to have some materials uh, to conduct uh, training themselves for other people. 
Uh, as mentioned before, it was also like the purpose of the different uh, photos. Uh, you saw that we use like different structures. Uh, I think uh, the different structure came um, from different sources. So it was also to test um, which one were like the most stable um, and also to protect uh, the, the production. So to avoid like any uh, damage uh, du during like the, the production. Coming back now on uh, coming on the lessons learned, but like the challenges uh, that we faced uh, during the implementation. Um, one was related to the fact that it was, so, as mentioned before, an integrated uh, project, uh, and in fact, like the uh, vertical gardening components were a bit like smaller than the wash. So the the wash part. Um, dictate a bit like the selection of beneficiaries and the camps where we went, uh, which unfortunately um, didn't really allow uh, like some time people to have enough time. So I think there were like good results in terms of production, but uh, I think one of the feedback was uh, the fact that, yeah, uh, people were lacking uh, time also to, to really um, work uh, on the gardens. So I think the yeah the potential like future programming would be really like to uh, work um, on like the identification uh, and we mentioned like I think the during the previous like presentation it was mentioned also like to empower women uh, so it could be also one of the um, things to, to work on um, for like women uh, in in the house to to. Uh, yeah, work on the garden and also one component that could be merged with the activity could be the cash for work uh, to really like allow uh, people to have time to um, produce and potentially like generate income for like the second phase of, of the project. Uh, the second like challenge faced was the um, access to water. Um, in the case like yeah, it, it's quite difficult to have um good uh, wash infrastructure allowing like um, access to water so i think the priority was for like drinking purpose and any like potential yeah infrastructure to implement uh, phase like the uh, was rejected by mrd uh, to, due to the fact that yeah the, um, it was like an official status of, of the case The third one, uh, the third like challenge, uh, was the beneficiaries didn't have access to seeds for the next season, and that's why before I was mentioning like the fact that it was like quite short term uh, project, uh, so we were not able like to work also on potential like uh, new seeds distribution to allow uh, to to increase maybe the the income uh, for the second phase that would um, yeah provide like uh, more impact and be like more sustainable also on, on long term. Um, the final uh, like challenge identify is uh, the fact Thomas, that please if you can wrap up in 30 seconds thanks yeah it's the last one perfect <laughs> i'll just go quickly for the last challenge is so yeah the difficulties uh, to manage vertical garden in summer uh, i think like the, the different structures that we mentioned before uh, I think some uh, like the one that worked the best were quite uh, the height and the, the soil was quite deep and that allow also like the better irrigation and to avoid also in summer to have like uh, three, four or five times uh, irrigation during the day. So I think the structure I recommended was uh, just to, to be quite uh, deep uh, to have like more soil allowing like to keep the, the irrigation and for yeah, the production. And yeah, that was like the last slide. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, really appreciate that you also uh, put uh, the challenges. Sometimes we don't see it uh, at the end of the presentation. So it's good to have uh, uh, good parties, but also challenges and how also you overcome it. Just for the audience, uh, <clears throat> Just uh, let's think also about uh, your your presentation, Thomas, was very good in terms of uh, technical uh, detailing also on the food security side, vegetables. Let's think also about the intersection between uh, 
the food security and the HLP rights. So maybe some question will come later also for you in this uh, Kabul informal settlement kind of uh, project. So thanks again. Um, I believe that the next one will be Syed Nasser. Um, so the Agricultural Technical Advisor for CRS, Syed Nasser Serat, I will leave you the floor. Okay, thank you all and thanks for your participation. Uh, Mustafa, if you can share the slide. In my internet. Syed, if you are able to speak a little bit louder, I think will help. Okay. Please. Do you hear me now? Yes, better. Yeah. Thank you. Mustafa, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry to share the. Said Nasir, if you have trouble sharing your screen, I can share and you can explain. Yeah, you can share because my internet is breaking down. Okay, so thank you all. And uh, I'm going to uh, briefly explain the uh, CRS uh, agricultural behavior change approach and uh, that we are doing currently in a rural area, uh, but some with some idea of that, how to uh, um, switch this to the urban and the urban uh, area. Uh, so uh, uh, the CRS Afghanistan uh, focused on uh, social behavior change that uh, already used by health and wash sectors. Means that the uh, agri scale agriculture development uh, and uh, uh, for uh, targeted group adopted the promoted practice uh, with some uh, criteria of the practice and technology and also training that we are introducing to the community. Uh, based on the theory, uh, most of the former or uh, easily and quickly uh, adopt for the technology and uh, practices and through those practices that uh, have the uh, criteria like uh, to be responsive uh, uh, and to be simple, uh, low risk, low cost, and quick result. The uh, evidence shows that most of the farmer and communities, member and beneficiary, widely applicate, um, um, uh, replicated such a uh, uh, practice that have the, this criteria. And this uh, uh, criteria uh, also we use the uh, diffusion of innovation uh, graphs that uh, it show the uh, different category of people living in the community like innovator, early adopters, early majority, late majority in regard, which means that uh, always in the uh, training and introducing of the technology and the introducing of the uh, practices through our uh, SPC approach, we always consider uh, all community and we, all, we invite all community members, uh, uh, especially one man and one man, woman from each household to attend uh, in the training and also to uh, later uh, practice the uh, uh, improved practices of the approach. So uh, the, this uh, men and women together when they attend to the training and also the other uh, upcoming practices, uh, it contribute to have us um, make decision together. And also it increase the women and men participation to the uh, uh, intervention and also the 
uh, for doing the practices. So also be uh, invite all community members because the any voters and every adopter have uh, very uh, specific influence uh, to uh, other that they are slower adopting and they uh, can be more uh, uh, influence them to do uh, the practices. If you go to the next slide. Uh, uh, so uh, in addition, uh, uh, after each training, we uh, uh, conduct uh, uh, monitoring and also formal feedback session and uh, conducting some specific session, a catalytic moment that to make sure uh, we receive the formal and the beneficiary feedback for the training, for the improved practices and the uh, approach. And then we uh, redesign our uh, approach and um, uh, training based on uh, former and beneficiary feedbacks. So here uh, I'm going to uh, uh, have, uh, share some experience of uh, CRS working in urban and pre-urban area, which uh, is the first thing is improved household data and diversity. Uh, focus that we introduced, uh, home, uh, which table home gardening, greenhouses and kitchen garden, and different uh, uh, provinces of Afghanistan, Herat, Bamiyan, Kundi, and uh, uh, but especially uh, here uh, we put it some information about the uh, Bamiyan uh, triarbon area that. Uh, it was very successful. Uh, we established greenhouse and kitchen gardens, and also uh, CRS <coughs> formed some for, for former producer group, men and women, to produce onion and garlic, and they uh, sell uh, to get uh, produce together and sell to the market, sell it to the market. And also, uh, we did uh, some very uh, important. Uh, uh, we introduced a very good, important technology, potato and onion storage that working very well in the rural area, but for sure it is working for the urban and pre-urban area as well that is uh, uh, good for storing potato and onion we, uh, uh, that decreased the losses. And also we, uh, we uh, did some uh, with poultry package, particularly women to sell in for nutrition of children and mother in the household. Uh, another thing is that uh, a small scale uh, livestock rearing, uh, having the goat uh, for the milking, you know, to produce milk and especially it is good for the consumption and also uh, using of the manual for the vegetable production of fish and garden. Uh, here is an, uh, another issue that uh, in urban, pre-urban area, one of the things that uh, uh, is uh, we find it out that typically density of animal population increase with human population, which is uh, very uh, related. Uh, and also in the individual approach rather than formalized community approach is recommended that is also important uh, to consider. Okay, so for next to Uh, here we have some uh, intervention uh, that uh, in, uh, in, uh, impact of uh, some of our inter intervention in the past as an example. For example, in Bombay Center in pre urban area, uh, CRS uh, formed 13 uh, producer group, male and female, they produce garlic and onion, and they made a profit of 3,450. Four USD dollar as a net profit during one uh, agricultural season. That uh, uh, the idea, the activity was that each family produced uh, well, separately, but they come together and they select a more collective marketing representative to sell to the market. One person transfer it to the market and then uh, pay the cash back to the each uh, member of the uh, group. And uh, the potato and kitchen storage that we are recommending for uh, the urban and pre-urban area is uh, really 
uh, important that uh, that it decreases the spoilage and due to losses in uh, from over 30 percent to less than five percent. That was very important. And uh, here also there are some table that show uh, the differences uh, that it uh, in uh, 2011 in 2013 uh, there are. Uh, the losses are 4.50 in 2011, 2013 for other, uh, some other villages, it's about 2%. Uh, percent. And as well as recently, two years ago, we piloted another uh, kitchen page that to store onion and potato that uh, all people are facing the challenge. Uh, we also uh, tested that, that there is uh, in, uh, very base losses for onion and also for the potato. So, in general, uh, it is uh, some short example in experiences from the uh, or past working, and uh, hopefully it is uh, contribute to the session. And uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Thank you, thank you, Syed. Um, very nice presentation and thanks also for highlighting the issue of food utilization and storage, which is very, very important. To reduce the food loss, maybe it's something that we can see also later within the question. So I'll, uh, I'll give the floor to the next uh, uh, presentation, which will be from Meder. And uh, um, I will leave the floor to Wahedullah Wahdat which is the senior food security supervisor for MEDER. OK, thank you. Abdullah. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, first, I will share the. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen yeah. and we can hear you. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Maybe if you uh, want to put the presentation um, on, on your screen so that we can see it. Uh, is that okay? Okay, is it uh, is it already better like this? Yeah. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, uh, we can share also the slide and the presentation of the on the chat after you give your presentation for the for the benefit of everyone. Please go ahead. Mike. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before uh, I share the experience and also the challenges we uh, made it faced in uh, during uh, the uh, past two or three years, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, describe the activities and also the intervention. It was the, uh, the project which we uh, now we are implementing. Media, it's a uh, multi-sector uh, intervention. Uh, so uh, this project is uh, currently we deliver, uh, delivering in uh, Central Highlands in Daikundi and Bamiyan provinces. And also in South region, we are implementing this uh, project in Kandahar and Rosgan provinces. Uh, 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 this is uh, this project has uh, food security, wash, and nutrition sectors. Uh, and in Daikundi uh, province, uh, we are implementing this in Miramur, uh, Khidir, and Shahristan areas, which are uh, uh, peri urban and uh, rural areas. And also in Kandahar province, we are working in urban areas. The total beneficiaries for the project of Kitchen Garden are uh, 2,935 uh, families, which are female or the beneficiaries. Uh, and this project is uh, for 15 months. Uh, 
first i want to describe uh, uh, talk about the activities which we done uh, when we start the project we distribute uh, 12 types of improved vegetable seeds for all the beneficiaries uh, and also we give them some uh, tools for cultivation uh, uh, training about how to make hotbeds and seedling transplantation to the plots. Uh, beside this, we provide beneficiaries with trainings about cultivation of vegetables and also how to make uh, hotbeds in technical ways from seeding to harvesting. Uh, behavior change in communication, we uh, media delivering uh, 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 trainings about BCC, uh, IYCF, and also about kitchen gardening. Uh, different sectors teaching component under BCC. It's uh, IYCF uh, hygiene and sanitation practices, and also about kitchen gardening. Uh, this year, because of uh, COVID-19, we were not able to conduct assembly meetings in the uh, villages. So we gave them uh, 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 separately for, uh, for the promoters uh, conduct some uh, uh, trainings. Uh, about hygiene and also about food security, about health. Uh, what media, the success and learning we uh, learn uh, during the uh, past years and also this year. In uh, rural areas, most of the women learned and used the local pest and disease management techniques we thought. We are not actually, we are not recommended uh, chemical. So how to manage pests and disease. So again, they give them some local pest and disease management trainings for the beneficiaries. We had to work with bigger garden spaces and the women were not able to cultivate all the seeds close to their houses. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, we gave them 12 types of uh, vegetable seeds. And the people beside their houses, they have no enough uh, land. So they cultivate some of the seeds beside uh, or inside their houses, but the other seeds they cultivate in the irrigated lands. And also we, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, distribute some hygiene materials, hygiene kits, and also drying racks uh, for vegetable, uh, harvesting and drying. In Central Highlands, the irrigation land belongs to men and the women also can cultivate together and help, me, uh, help the, uh, the men. They are helping in cultivation, weeding, irrigation and harvesting. Mostly the land belong to uh, men. The women were uh, able to collect seed from some vegetables and they will continue for next years. Drying vegetables and making tomato paste for using during the winter. The challenges which we faced, the context of Bamiyam is good and there is no any limitation for women to work with them. The main problem was not enough property land for kitchen garden beside their houses, irrigated lands or far from their houses. Uh, no enough in the irrigation water during the spring season or the summer season. And also COVID-19, we didn't conduct assembly meetings this year. In Kandahar province, uh, as we work with the people in urban areas, so we faced some challenges uh, implementing the kitchen garden activities for past several years. Uh, the context of Kandahar is a bit uh, different. Uh, there we had more limitation and could only work with women whose families agrees, uh, agreed for her participation and she also 
was willing for the time energy needed. Where the household had a large enough central country yard that received sunshine. The gardens were also grown inside the compound in the center of household. So many women did not plant uh, all the vegetable types because uh, the plots inside the household are not that large. In Kandahar, uh, some uh, things which we found, uh, many women struggled to make sure the plants were well watered because there was 100% uh, recall of message on using household water for irrigation. The same women were also reached through care groups with IYCF messages. We saw imp improvement in these important indicators especially management uh, dietary diversity for children under two. Uh, and also many women struggled with seed saving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wahidullah. Very very good and very interesting to see all this point also related to the to the gender issues and access uh, to the land and to the resources but also to the agricultural input when it comes to to women farmers um so i'll um, the next one is uh UN habitat is uh, balaji mohan i hope that i pronounce well the name balaji and uh, over to you, uh, you're the urban planning specialist of UN Habitat. The floor is yours. Uh, we can't hear you, I don't think, just in case you're still on mute. Can I be heard? I hear you now, Balaji. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, um, uh, yes, my name is <laughs> pronounced correctly. I'll just start sharing my screen now. Uh, can my screen, <clears throat> screen be uh, seen clearly? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just, uh, I won't go into the uh, the importance of, you know, having urban agriculture uh, as, a, as a security for food and uh, uh, land rights. I think that is sort of already understood in our group and uh, it is going to be, uh, it is not something new. Uh, what I would like to talk about and introduce is the program that we are currently working on. Um, uh, my name is uh, Balaji. I'm an urban planner, um, an architect, an urban designer. I'm currently working on the Shura program for uh, UN Habitat in Afghanistan. Uh, Shura program is an incremental uh, housing uh, program. Uh, due to its scale, it's almost uh, uh, a large uh, township program for returnees and IDPs. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have been myself on the program for a, almost a year now, and the program has been going on for uh, almost more than five to six years, six years now. Uh, in the following slides, I will briefly introduce the program and then how uh, I will also try to uh, uh, introduce how we are trying to integrate urban agriculture into our program. And uh, So the uh, Shura program is a multi-layered uh, um, incremental housing program. It involves uh, multiple government agencies from municipalities, CREDA, uh, uh, Ministry of Urban Development. Uh, it is primarily based on the presidential degree of uh, land uh, uh, allocation 
which was formerly 305 and recently it's been renamed as 108. Um, we are currently at the process of uh, um, uh, already gathered all the uh, land through the land bank uh, and Arasi's uh, help. There is enough land for everyone, I guess, uh, in various uh, provinces. And uh, through the program, we also have, uh, at least until July, we have uh, close to uh, 14,000 uh, head of families who have registered for the program. Uh, currently, the program is uh, ongoing in, uh, on a site in uh, Herat uh, at a little more advanced stage, and then on a site in El Tafat, which is near uh, Kabul, uh, comes under Kabul. And between the two sites, uh, uh, almost uh, 14,000 families have registered. Uh, there are uh, male, um, 10,000 male families, there is male headed families and almost 3,000, more than 3,000 female headed families. We are at the current process of beneficiary selection, which is ongoing. So what we have is uh, an incremental housing uh, a program, just to give you a brief, it's, uh, there is a seed money which is given to the families along with a plot of land, which varies between 250 square meters to 300 or 350 square meters. The majority plot size being about 250 square meters. And uh, using <clears throat> the uh, seed money and using uh, the uh, techniques that uh, can be taught to them in terms of construction, we are hoping that the, the, uh, the beneficiaries would uh, settle down and manage to grow uh, both in terms of um, wealth and uh, health. But it is uh, not a very easy thing to do. All most of our sites are uh, greenfield sites. Uh, they are they are very close to uh, about half an hour away from existing urban centers, so that is a good thing for us. But at the same time, uh, more, a lot of sites that we are uh, we have identified or that has been identified by the uh, government agencies are uh, empty greenfield sites. Uh, so it's it's good and bad. It's uh, the negatives are basically because it's uh, most of them they are barren land and hence why for us urban agriculture can be a very very uh, key uh, um, program to include uh, in terms of um, why it is good because it also gives us an opportunity to uh, design and develop from this from the scratch and uh, you know make not not make all the mistakes that other settlements have made and try to include urban agriculture from the beginning itself at, at multiple scales. Um, the, uh, the program organizes uh, the, um, the families as a CDC and uh, a few CDCs make a gozar. Uh, the, the, <clears throat> the, the settlement design follows the guidelines from the CDC structure. Um, this is actually one of the most important slides where uh, the main like the, it was really interesting for me to see the earlier presentations from uh, and how they were talking about different scales and they were talking about more of a backyard and plots and you know, uh, few of the houses coming together scale. So it is, we have an opportunity to include all of those scales in the program uh, because we are dealing with uh, thousands of um, households and plots. And if we are able to address it, think about it in the first step of the settlement design, then we can ensure that uh, urban agriculture is not just used as part of a backyard or maybe a few houses, but it almost it is almost like sort of integrated with the settlement itself, you know, along the lanes, along the streets, along the public spaces. Then it becomes a whole culture of um, agriculture. You know, it is not something that is isolated. It is not something that is um, sort of uh, segregated from other. Uh, uh, development, it almost becomes a lifestyle or it almost becomes a culture. And the fact that it is uh, it is in the public domain also would also encourage other people to pick up easily, you know, versus uh, agriculture happening in a more private backyard sort of a setting. So we are trying to look at it in terms of uh, multiple scales. Uh, just to give you an example uh, of uh, the block scale, block scale, which is basically about uh, 100 and uh, like the CDC level, which is about 120 houses to 140 houses. And uh, we have realized that almost um, uh, 10 to 15 percent of these uh, areas can be allocated as a central space. Now it is up to the people 
to use it either as a playground or a children's uh, park or, or just a park or whatever they want to use it as. But in case there is the adjoining block already has a park, maybe the people will have an option of choosing this space not to be used as a park and they can actually use it as a, a urban farming uh, sort of a space. And the idea we are also trying to provide a water infrastructure for between a series of plots. Now the idea in, instead of providing those water outlets between the uh, plots or closer to the house, if we provide them actually in the central uh, neighborhood community level spaces, there would be more uh, opportunities for people to kind of come together, uh, mingle with each other, and also use the water to um, practice urban farming. At a plot level, uh, again, going back to one of the earlier presentations, I found the vertical farming very interesting. Uh, now, the Afghan house form involves a courtyard, sort of a house, and it also involves, uh, not many people want to have the house in the front, but when they, if they have to make a plot boundary with the walls, uh, why not make it uh, uh, with a cheap uh, uh, system where the, the plot boundary can also become some sort of vertical farming uh, solutions. So we were trying to look at all of these options and by, by making a small change, it could even double up the area of area available for farming within a plot. Um, and uh, also it has much better effects towards the outside. So because when you're walking along a series of these plots, uh, instead of having this dull uh, compound wall, you can actually have greenery on the uh, vertical surfaces as well. And uh, we are also trying to see if we can include it in the, the, at the street state level. Usually, if you notice, the Afghan streets are mostly with the coniferous forests, which, which are not more than just mere windbreakers. They add no uh, value. They don't add much value to the uh, street itself. So if we change some of those tree lines into maybe fruit trees, or uh, we can even use the trees uh, that are along lined along the streets uh, into uh, an, uh, an almost like an orchard. So if we start with something like this, maybe in a few Sorry. years it could. Malaji, one uh, almost... to go, please. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and it could actually change the whole urban environment into a much more uh, green and livable sort of a space. So the. The challenges for us is how do we transform one of the sites that we have uh, that looks like this into a workable community uh, or, a, or a happy settlement that could look like that. And uh, I, I'm, I welcome any uh, comments or advice from people who have already been part of uh, some similar programs. Uh, it will be a very uh, good learning experience uh, for us. Uh, these are some of the policy recommendations uh, in terms of how uh, land uh, uh, rights and uh, urban farming can actually uh, encourage people to settle down and feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Balaj, to also to put the perspective of uh, urban planning into that. Uh, I believe it's a, it's a very important perspective, especially if we look into not only into food security, but also in the part of the social cohesion and the environmental kind of approach <clears throat> yes. to our intervention. So thanks a lot. Um, I think we have uh, the last uh, presenter now. So I would invite uh, Evelyn Airo, who is the information counseling and legal assistance advisor at uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, NRC. Evelyn, over okay. to you. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen shortly. Okay, thank you. So my presentation is focused on land tenure security and women's economic empowerment specifically focusing on economic empowerment of displaced women. Um, so we'll start with a quick background just to kind of uh, give you a short uh, snapshot of what it looks like. So we all know that the fulfillment of economic uh, rights of vulnerable populations are directly linked to sustainable livelihoods, economic inclusion, and self-reliance. So broadly looking at my presentation is based on experience from um, Africa and looking at the East Africa region. In Sub-Saharan Africa, access to land and resources is mostly insecure, 
and it's threatened by increased pressure on land and also forced displacement. As you know, the displacement uh, context in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in East African region, has had implications on land tenure security. And also this pressure has been related to the growing land market and uh, national policies that favor pri privatization and agribusiness. Then you find that women are particularly disproportionately affected and the majority of them have no ownership or secure access to land and other vital resources. And so displacement actually makes complicates this uh, further. So within the context of displacement, we know that it's very important that uh, beyond the emergency, um, during the protracted displacement and when we come to care and maintenance, uh, self-reliance remains important uh, for us to be able to discuss options around durable solutions and also create avenues for local integration. So I have a case study uh, that is from the East Africa region that uh, kind of highlights uh, these issues. So if you, you look at the screen, you'll see that in East Africa, there was a lot of focus on security of land tenure, but a lot of it was mainly looking at uh, securing land tenure for accommodation for displaced populations. So we focused a lot on ensuring that displaced persons had security of land tenure for their accommodation in the place of displacement. And we also moved further to ensure that um, households uh, headed by women were offered special protection, uh, ensuring that they are included in uh, occupancy certificates where the land is actually donated, their tenure was secure. But little was done to secure uh, their livelihoods and security of tenure for their livelihoods. So we know that most of our livelihoods interventions also have income generating activities, small businesses that are always done in groups. So little was being done to ensure that these businesses had security of tenure. So what happened is that we saw increased evictions of, of business groups, but specifically women who are owning businesses were mainly targeted. Once the businesses began to make profit, rent was increased, or if they did not have a proper document and had a receipt to prove payment, they were evicted or their tenancy was terminated. Uh, and that affects the continuity of business. So in order to ensure equitable participation of women in economic activities, we offered legal assistance uh, that provided businesses with more administrative support to ensure they had the right documentation, also ensuring that beyond business registration, they also had the, their tenancy uh, clarified. So the tenancy arrangements needed to be clarified. We needed to go through due diligence for the business premises to establish ownership, ensure they either had a rental agreement or they had a lease and that the terms and conditions uh, for termination of the lease were clear and that also it met all the standards before an eviction um, was uh, conducted. So that is, that is a, an example of um, the implications of tenure security when it comes to economic empowerment. You cannot empower them using just income or business investments without looking at the security of tenure because it can be used to disenfranchise uh, vulnerable people. So some of the obstacles that we have come across when you look at women's economic empowerment within the context of land tenure security, there are several, but we've looked at four main ones that feature a lot that I'm very sure may feature in the regions that we have had presentations from as well. One of them is literacy levels. Where literacy levels are low, it affects the ability to understand land tenure arrangements, and it does impact security of tenure and actually affects the economic empowerment of these vulnerable groups and specifically women. We know that in most of the regions where we work with in, or and in most of the communities we work in and the groups that we work with, the literacy levels of women are usually low compared to their male counterparts. And so most of them, uh, uh, easily enter into arrangements or tenure arrangements under duress, or they may not understand the terms and conditions of these agreements. And this affects, um, has implications for economic empowerment. It also has implications for the sustainability of any, of any business. Uh, the other is equality versus equitable distribution of resources. We need to understand that 
displaced, uh, displaced populations have understood our arrangement uh, when we are responding to displacement. They know that when um, they know our vulnerability criteria, they know that when a household is headed by a female member, they receive more humanitarian assistance. They also know that when women are in the documents as head of household, then we will actually uh, select them as a beneficiary and will prioritize that. So we need to also understand that having equal rights is different from the equitable distribution. In most of the cases, sometimes the head of household is female, but the decision is actually being made by the male member of the household. And those dynamics does those dynamics do affect economic empowerment of women because much as the business or income generating activities being um, managed by a woman, but the power dynamics based on the way we distribute our income generating grants and the way we secure tenure is based on the head of household. And that may not be the reality. So those are some of the obstacles. The other is cultural practices and perceptions. Cultural practices and perceptions within the community affect women's ability to generate, use and control resources to support their uh, economic well-being and that of their families. We know that in displacement, it's a lot of women are involved in actually looking after the economic well-being of their families. And yet we know that cultural practices and perceptions does affect this. When a woman's income base begins to increase and when she's using family property that does not have security of tenure, what does that mean culturally? What perceptions do the community begin to have? And how do those cultural practices and perceptions affect economic empowerment? What dynamics do they present within the context of security uh, of land tenure security? The last one is access to credit and documentation. Uh, when we are looking at uh, accessing credit, uh, when you're econ during econ for economic empowerment, you need to have access to credit. You need to have finances as a resource to be economic to uh, engage in economic activity. So access to credit and documentation is sometimes a barrier to financial inclusion. Do women have the ability to use family property as security to access credit? Uh, does do they have equal uh, rights as men? All those issues are obstacles to, to women's economic empowerment. So I have also highlighted some key uh, considerations, challenges, and uh, recommendations as we look. Evelyn, just if you can close within one minute, so we leave also space to the yes. question. Thanks. Yes, this is the, this is, I'm concluding. So these are the, you will see the perceptions around tenure security and land access rights through customary structures need a more in-depth review. The lack of knowledge by communities on the dynamics of ongoing land tenure reforms and implications for livelihood, and specifically when it comes to women, women's needs and preferences in productive activities, and also the role of local leaders and customary structures in land distribution and the resolution of disputes. So this is the last slide that looks at key recommendations. One of the recommendations is to plan for livelihoods that reach beyond agriculture, but also ensuring that gender is mainstreamed uh, to support women access credit through more inclusive and participatory approaches informed by community action planning and adaptive learning, meaning that communities are actually involved in action planning and adaptive learning so that we can actually hear from the affected population. And then to mainstream land rights in livelihoods interventions to ensure that the women's land rights issues that are usually uh, uh, addressed through a human rights-based approach are also incorporated in our livelihoods interventions. And this will, in essence, ensure they're economically empowered and self-reliant. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Evelyn. And thanks for, for highlighting all this obstacle that prevent uh, women economic empowerment, and, uh, but also tenure security and uh, related issues on the HLP rights. Um, Jim, would you like to take some question from the chat? I think there were a couple. Uh, yeah, I you... mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think this is, we have, uh, you know, 10, 12 minutes just to have some questions. So if people have things that they would like to ask, please do. Um, one thing that did um, come up as a question that was sort of raised, I think, was around um, how to make these solutions sustainable. So, uh, you know, is cash for work component and supplying seeds, could that create dependency? What are the, how do we make these solutions sustainable? So that was a question um, that came up. Um, 
and um, I mean, I, I personally slightly, uh, you know, to take advantage of my position as facilitator, would like to ask um, particularly some of the earlier presenters just how they see the issues of land rights and security of tenure impacting their work. Um, it was amazing to hear the innovations around how to encourage different ways to, to grow food and, and to create that. Um, it would be really interesting to hear how your work had encountered those issues around land rights and whether or not that had been something you'd faced was security of tenure having an impact were you working on those issues um so that would be there's there's two questions in there i don't know davide if you wanted to ask something um Uh, no, no, I think uh, it's good. We can go also for a round, uh, I think, of experience on what you just uh, mentioned, because I believe it's very important that also the aim here is also to check how we, we deal with the, with the <clears throat> land tenure and experiences uh, related to urban agriculture. So um, any colleague from, um, from uh, World Vision, ACF, CRS, or Medair, you and Habitat that have presented want to give some uh, insight of it. Yeah, maybe like just for regarding like the distribution of seeds, uh, it's Thomas from, from ACF. Uh, yeah, I, I saw like yeah, the, the question, I think it's yeah, part of the risk, uh, like to have like cash for work and seeds distribution. Instead, in terms of sustainability, um, could could be like the, the risk, and that's why also I think it could be a one of the things could be to really like increase this part of the train uh, in the trainings to to explain also how, how to make it sustainable and to link uh, with uh, the different uh, markets uh, after to have access to to seeds um, later on. But yeah, I think it's part of the risk also that that we discuss. Uh, and just regarding like the other question, I, um, regarding like uh, the land issue, I think it was we, what we faced also with especially like the wash uh, access. Um, so yeah, in terms of like urban centers activities, um, I think there is like, yeah, one working group also that integrates this part also for wash to see how, uh, which kind of infrastructure, infrastructure um, could be used uh, and, and for that, yeah, we are like trying to work also, it's like one topic that came uh, quite, again, like quite recently in the working group to try to overcome like this challenge of the uh, impossibility to, in, to install like infrastructure in informal settlements. So to continue on the integrated approach. Thank you. Over. And also for uh, uh, sustainability issue, uh, uh, we experienced that, especially about the seed issue, that uh, in the past, uh, we also find it out that uh, always the distribution uh, uh, is not a solution. Uh, we take uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, we use uh, some approach to, uh, for example, especially which table seed in Afghanistan, uh, always it is challenging and uh, most people cannot purchase that and also for other uh, quality seed. Uh, we try to introduce seed production. For example, uh, many of our uh, beneficiary are currently in addition of producing vegetables in the greenhouse and the vegetable, they produce the seed by themselves uh, that do not go to the market because uh, this is uh, difficult then as well as for, uh, for example, for other crops like potato or uh, wheat, which are uh, staple crops, always be also teaching them how to select the uh, seed uh, and produce quality seed by themselves. So uh, yeah, there are some things that uh, we can think that are controllable and for sustainability uh, for inter agricultural intervention. Thank you, Said. Um, did anyone else want to speak? Evelyn, I thought I saw you unmute, but I didn't know if you were going to speak or No, I, I, I had seen a question from Shazad. Uh, yes. It, yes. So just in response to that, uh, one of the, maybe we can draw learning, one of the, thing, the things that we have, the approaches that we've used is to place a conditionality 
on the income generating grants that we offer. So whenever there are groups, we, we, we are very specific about gender considerations uh, in terms of the income uh, generating grants that we provide to groups. So if we have a group of comprising men and women, and we know that women are facing a specific barrier, we ensure that the conditions are that women and men in the group have equal rights and that this is documented and it's a condition for uh, providing the grant. And we have a post distribution monitoring that looks at these gender considerations and then um, makes recom uh, recommendations for improvement or for an additional grant or top up. So that is one of the, the strategies we've used to mitigate this. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, I had a, a question, um, Balaji, I, I noticed at the end of your presentation, you mentioned some policy recommendations around HLP, but you weren't really able to talk about them. I wondered if there were any key uh, recommendations you would make around HLP that would relate maybe to some of the other presentations or some of the issues that we've looked at today. And if anyone else wants to add questions to the chat, please do. Thank you, uh, Jim. Um, uh, so, I, my recommendations are more from the um, the, uh, the spatial point of view because usually, uh, whenever uh, we intervene in a site, there is already an existing um, scenario uh, with uh, you know, and that leads to a lot of challenges. So in terms of uh, you know land being available or uh, whether the uh, people are you know, not able to come together, uh, the way uh, we are trying to uh, uh, progress in the Shura program is because we have uh, we are able to we have these large empty lands for us to um, to sort of start this greenfield kind of development. We are at a sort of a unique advantage where we are able to think of all of these aspects from the from the beginning, uh, the first step of the planning and design as well. So it gives us this uh, small leverage to um, uh, uh, ensure that the, the urban farming can be incorporated at the multi-scale uh, sort of level. And uh, uh, just to give a few uh, recommendations, so that was the first uh, point of the, rec the first recommendation. And the, the second one was usually in these housing uh, settlements, uh, it's, it's easy to actually give the land to people and make a house for them sometimes, but it is very, very difficult for them to actually remain in the space. Uh, and I feel that one of the ways in which urban agriculture can help the people is when they start using the land, not just to live, uh, uh, but also to you know, start farming, uh, because a lot of times, their um, uh, labor markets are very uh, uh, are in, uh, uh, very uh, seasonal and they are fluctuating most of the time. And having a backup uh, of agriculture is uh, something that they can have as a as a as an income. Uh, you know, when there is no regular income from their other jobs. So in that way, it, it helps as well. And again, we we are um, uh, the beneficiaries. We have uh, almost. Uh, um, uh, almost as much as uh, men um, headed households, we also have women headed households. So we are hoping that that would uh, uh, encourage uh, gender equity. And um, uh, one of the, the final points that we are trying to make is also recommend is to not just for the provision of such uh, infrastructure, but also uh, training and enable uh, dedicated market space. Uh, which can link all the CDCs and the Gozas and uh, and the people who are in the production of it to link it all the way uh, to the uh, to this the sale of the product as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Davide. Did you have uh, any questions or things you wanted to highlight? I'm aware of the time. Uh, maybe I see a comment in the chat box that can open to a quick uh, question. So there is, uh, I think, uh, Matthias wrote in the in the box. Uh, um, in many countries, if somebody plants a tree, the ground will be for him. Would this be a problem for a habitat project? And it's also the case in Afghanistan. But maybe to give it a broader thought is a uh, 
maybe if you can share uh, from the previous presenters a um, couple of uh, example on uh, you know the impact of urban agriculture uh, and um, on the social cohesion uh, uh, issues would be great to see how this has uh, prevented conflict someone uh, for example was mentioned it before and um, or on the other side the thing that we need to to avoid in order to do not create conflict so maybe if someone who presented before can answer to that. Uh, just to address the uh, the trees being planted in public spaces, uh, we we are at a position where we are not just working with the beneficiaries uh, who are you know the private people. We are actually all, all our time so far actually has been spent with working with the government departments like MUDL and uh, um, the urban planning department of Afghanistan. So they already have these, uh, you know, these street designs or uh, these uh, uh, different kinds of uh, road designs in which they, you know, they have like this very simple uh, coniferous forest kind of uh, coniferous trees sort of uh, this thing. So where if uh, and in our settlements we they will be anyway engaging in making the streets. So what we are trying to propose is infuse these sort of urban agriculture principles not just for the the beneficiaries and their private plots but also in the public space where the, if, if we just change the species of what the tree, the trees that the MUDL and the department, you know, the housing uh, department would be using, that itself will, you know, uh, change like almost close to 3000 to 5000 trees from being a simple coniferous uh, trees that are merely just wind uh, uh, breakers. It can actually change into something like an urban orchard or something that would produce fruits. Okay. Anyone want to to add uh, any experience on uh, on the urban agriculture and uh, land uh, issues that create uh, good uh, impact in terms of social cohesion? Otherwise, I'm a bit uh, conscious of the time, Jim. I don't know. If, uh... Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, yeah, we'd sort of allotted an hour and a half and I know um, people may well have things they need to get to. So, um, yeah, I think in terms of drawing things to a close, if there are any last points or last questions that people would want to raise and then we will um, wrap it up for now although just to say this is such a welcome conversation and as Davide said earlier it's fantastic to see the um, the joint um, discussion this joint event between food security and agriculture and then housing London property task force and the protection cluster and hopefully we will have many more of these as, as we as we continue on um, does anyone have a last uh, comment or brief question to to make before we wrap up Something I posted in the chat was um, a link, which initially was the wrong link, but I've corrected the link, um, to a joint publication between Food Security and Agriculture Cluster and the HLP Task Force um, on Urban Agriculture for Sustainable IDP and Returnee Settlements in Afghanistan. So that, that may well be of interest uh, to you. I'm also going to um, just um, paste in the chat um, a link to join the HLP AOR mailing list, if that would be of interest, no pressure, but um, in case you are interested to hear more about, about work related to HLP. And, and as I say, we're really keen to kind of build relationships across clusters and sectors. So that's something we're keen to do. Um, Davide, did you want to have the, uh, the final word and uh, uh, just uh, sort of anything you want to tie together? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that uh, again, I would reiterate the issue that is a very welcome conversation from our side, from the global perspective as well. And I would uh, really <clears throat> encourage you to share any, you know, gap in terms of information or technical issues that we can fill from our side, 
I think we, we have uh, both clusters uh, at global level, different working groups that can help on this. And we can even uh, use this uh, opportunity to, to start uh, some uh, good work together. I would say that uh, there are a few things that were, uh, were raised by the different presenters, few, let's say, key issues. Um, in terms of, uh, I think, uh, poverty and, uh, and uh, relative relation to the conflict um, and uh, the de dependency versus uh, longer term solution. Um, community involvement, I think it's also a very important uh, issue when it comes to uh, urban spaces. And, uh, and also, uh, I believe that uh, one of the big issue is uh, that came in all presentation was the access to resources, especially water. This make me also reinforce the, the fact that it's very important to coordinate. I don't say that because we are from the global cluster coordination team, but because uh, simply I believe that there are many, many, many literature and uh, documents already available, uh, which can be of use of uh, everyone. And we need to work better also to, you know, I think to, in, to, to look at these intersectoralities, uh, where sometimes we are too much working in, in silos. So I believe that uh, with that, I think it's, uh, uh, it's important for us to, to hear uh, your points, your challenges, and we'll do maybe, you know, we'll, we'll be available to also share whatever is important in terms of, uh, you know, a uh, way to find out where to, or how to ask, or where to ask if you need any technical support or to develop it from our side directly. And uh, thanks again for the uh, organizers uh, to give us this opportunity. We're very pleased. And uh, Jim, last word to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you to uh, the Housing, Land and Property Task Force in Afghanistan and to the Food and Security and Agriculture Cluster in Afghanistan for making this possible and bringing together these presenters. Um, as I said the, at the beginning, this meeting has been recorded, so we will look to share that recording so you can have a look again at, at what's been said. Um, you've seen a number of the presentations and other resources in the chat. I'll leave the meeting open for a little bit of time in case people want to access some of those resources. Um, but otherwise, just want to say, uh, yeah, thanks so much for being with us and um, yeah, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>